In my research, I have found that collaboration with people of different viewpoints, although challenging, generally leads to successful technological and scientific advancements. One of the strangest collaborations was between 19th century proponents and opponents of Moses' six days of creation. Although they were completely opposed to each other, their combined efforts led to great advances, or at least should have led to great advances in natural history. Too bad they didn't take advantage of their work. So in the 19th century, scientists and theologians saw a correlation between Moses' six days of creation and the newly developed sciences of geology, paleontology, and astronomy. Thus, they concluded that Moses' days of creation represented ages of time. Respected professors were the leading proponents of the day-age interpretation during the 19th century. They included Arnold Guyot of Princeton, Princeton, James Dana of Yale, and John Dawson of McGill University in Canada. Charles Hodge was the principal of Princeton Theological Seminary, and he included Guyot's day-age interpretation in his systematic theology. He said, Professor Dana of Yale and Professor Guyot of Princeton belong to the first rank of scientific naturalists, and the Friends of the Bible owe them a debt of gratitude for their able vindication of the sacred record. Guyot realized that he was dealing with an immature version of natural history. And in his article in the New York Times in the mid 19th century, he stated, we may only suspend judgment till all possible light is attained and then arrive at a perfect understanding of both. Many things may be explained, some little point may still possess some little obscurity, but in the future, every new ray of light displaces some cloud which remain to obscure our vision. Well, there were many opponents to the day age interpretation. Uh, there were many debates over this and evolution and so on. Henry Morton was the president of the Stevens Institute of Technology. And in 1897, which was 13 years after Guyo died, he wrote two articles in Bibliotheca Sacra, which summarized the arguments of theologians and scientists opposed to Guyot's day age interpretation. Morton did not think that God inspired Moses and thus assumed that there could not be any correlation between Moses and natural history. Thus, he looked for errors in Guyot's interpretation. This was good because a fan wouldn't have been so critical. The strange thing is that Morton defined future advances in cosmology and paleontology by outlining the discrepancies. So here's the process. Guyot looked for correlations between natural science and Moses' six days based on 19th century natural history. Morton then looked for discrepancies between Guyot's interpretations and Moses' statements. Thus, Morton found weaknesses in the 19th century models of natural history. This synergy was possible because Moses' six days were accurate natural history. And I think I will show that in this presentation. So the following slides look at each day with Guyot's interpretation, Morton's critique, and the subsequent alignment with 21st century natural history. So Guyot thought that the first two days were a prologue to the six days. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which Guyot interpreted as the creation of the universe. And the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the waters. So Guyot lived prior to the Big Bang model and the dominant paradigm at the time was the Laplace Herschel nebular hypothesis of the 19th century. And it explained, or at least attempted to explain the formation of galaxies and solar systems and planets. In this model, the early universe had galactic scale clouds of matter. And Guyot interpreted verse two to mean that God originally created the clouds as inactivated matter 
And then the Holy Spirit activated the clouds with gravitational and chemical energy. Morton pointed out that there was no earth, water, or turbulence in Guyot's inactivated matter clouds. In the modern model of solar system formation, a dark molecular cloud formed in the Milky Way. Our sun is a third generation star, which means that the cloud that formed the solar system contained water, ice, organic molecules, and mineral dust, with water ice being the primary material, with many elements required for a planet for, with life. Uh, dark molecular clouds are extremely void. They have less matter than a total vacuum on Earth. And they are dark because the dust absorbs the light. So they really have a precise fit with Moses' characteristics, formless, void, Earth, waters, and darkness. In addition, they have huge winds, so there's turbulence, if that matters. And in my mind, the spirit was there because he periodically intervened in the formation of the solar system. Now we come to day one. Guyot thought that the first day described the formation of light. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God called the light day. Well, according to the Laplace Herschel Nebular hypothesis, the clouds in the early universe uh, at the scale of galaxies collapsed by gravity. And Guyot thought that the spirit activated the cloud of matter in the early universe with gravity and other forces, which would have created energy and caused light during collapse. So according to Laplace Herschel, the cloud formed a giant light at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Morton pointed out that a distant light in the Milky Way was not the light of day as in verse four, which almost all theologians at the time agreed was the sun. Well, the modern model of the formation of the sun follows the same gravitational collapse model as the Laplace Herschel nebular hypothesis. However, rather than forming a giant central light at the center of the galaxy, the sun formed from an individual section of a dark molecular cloud. Thus, Morton's argument that the light of day one was the sun was fulfilled by the modern model of stellar formation from dark molecular clouds. Guyot's day two had the formation of a thin disk in the Milky Way. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. Guyot argued that the word translated as expanse referred to a shape that is thin and spreading out. He interpreted expanse as the spreading out of the light of the Milky Way galaxy in the shape of the spiral Milky Way or as a disk. And he did mention that the Milky Way had the shape of a disk and that the planet formed as disks. He thought the disk was composed of the light of the galaxies, which he must have thought was composed of illuminated particles. He interpreted the separations as the formation of individual solar systems, so we have one down here, and planets within the disk. And this is seen here in this bottom circle and in the spiral galaxy picture, which is an expansion of that little circle, uh, and spiral solar system picture here the forming solar system. He also pictured the solar system as a disk, which would be another form of expanse. Morton observed that the expanse was in the midst of the waters and that there was no water in the spreading out of the light of the Milky Way. So it was the wrong material. Uh, the, now in the modern model, the circumstolar disk formed in the midst of the waters. In the midst means bisector. And in the solar system formation model, the circumsolar disk perfectly bisects the remaining molecular cloud, which would have been waters, which was already, yeah, which was already defined as waters. So based on analysis of similar words in Hebrew, Gorg in the theological dictionary of the Old Testament stated that the most likely shape of the expanse was a flat plate, which is the shape of a disk. And Morton, although thought that the shape was a dome, which is a popular view, but the Hebrew word um, and the meaning of bisector argue against a dome shape. A dome can't bisect anything. Circumsolar disks concentrate useful solid water, ice, and dust in the mid-plane dust layer, layer, which is where the planets form. And this fits the definition of the word separate, which implies the separation of useful waters from useless waters, waters that wouldn't form the planets. 
In Guyot's model, the first part of day three describes the formation of the planet. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let dry land appear. Guyot stated the main idea is condensation of matter into a solid globe, its liquid covering and gaseous envelope. The problem was that he thought that the earth began as a small sun and then cooled off and became a planet as implied by the Laplace Herschel Nebular hypothesis. Morton pointed out that this verse could not possibly refer to the formation of the earth as a sun, subsequent cooling and formation of a solid planet. The 19th century concept of the earth beginning as a sun, a small sun was not compatible with the waters gathering to one place and dry land appearing. In the modern model and in the verse, the waters and dust in the inner disk midplane gathered together and formed Earth and the other interterrestrial planets. The interpretation as the inner disk rather than below the disk or below the expanse is justified by the LAMED preposition prior to expanse, which implies the upper and lower parts of a wall rather than the opposite sides of a wall. According to a recent paper in Nature, radioisotope data indicates that the water vaporized in planets in the inner disk due to heat from aluminum-26 radiation forming the dry terrestrial planets. And this is why the Earth and other terrestrial planets are primarily dry. This fits the statement, waters gathered and dry land appeared. Eventually, seas form due to a volcanic emission of water. And I'd like to point out that a different word is translated as gathered, uh, mikvah rather than kava, uh, with respect to the naming of the seas in verse 10, which, are, which is not shown here. We now come to one of the main arguments against the validity of the day age model, the appearance of plants prior to animals of the fifth day. The second part of day three describes the formation of plants. Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth, bearing seed after their kind with seed in them. And in, there were no known plants in the Precambrian geologic formations, which is the time period that this would imply. However, as a geologist, Guyot was familiar with microorganisms in the Precambrian geologic formations. So he thought that the plants of day three were microbial algae. While this is a stretch, algae are photosynthetic organisms, but Morton thought that it was ridiculous to compare the plants of Moses' third day to microbial algae. You know, they have, um, no, there's no fruit trees, there's no seeds and so on. And he also thought there was no difference in microorganisms prior to the Cambrian uh, between like animal and plant precursors, which wasn't correct, but that isn't the point here. It turns out that Morton's critique was right again. Within the last several years, scientists realized that plants evolved deep in the Precambrian, possibly 1 billion years ago. Thus, Moses really was referring to plants in the Precambrian. The fourth day was also controversial. Um, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and they shall serve as signs and for seasons and for days and years. Guyot and other day age proponents thought that the fourth day referred to the appearance of the sun, moon and stars in heaven visible from earth. He thought that the, uh, when the earth cooled off, the haze in the atmosphere vanished. So the earth was no longer a sun. Um, modern people with this viewpoint think that some haze um, vanished and the sun and moon were visible. But the um, haze on the earth, if there was any, actually vanished at the end of the Archean 2.3 billion years ago, and plants then appeared after that. So that really doesn't work anymore either. Morton thought that let there be must refer to the creation of the sun, moon, and stars on day four. Of course, he already said that the sun was created on day one. So I really don't understand this. And some scholars still have the same interpretation that the sun, moon, and stars were created on day four. Uh, Morton said that Moses would have said that the lights appeared if the meaning were that the sun, moon, and stars simply appeared in the sky. In my estimation, there is now an event in natural history that matches Moses day four. Um, there were equatorial glaciations in the Proterozoic, which was the Precambrian, and two theories have been, been proposed to explain it. 
uh, both by um, credible geologists. In the holist hypothesis, the Earth went from an axis that point to, pointed towards the sun to the present 23 degree, degree angle of obliquity with its pleasant diurnal and seasonal cycles. And that would match the idea that the lights were placed in the expanse because the expanse is a solar system. So the positions of the sun and moon are in the current solar system. The other theory is the entire earth was covered by ice, snowball earth. Uh, most of the geologic evidence, in fact, all points towards the holist hypothesis. The only thing arguing against it is they don't know how the earth's axial tilt would have changed. So let's summarize. Uh, Mose, Morton objected to six of Guyot's interpretations in the first four days. The substance of the cloud, you know, earth and waters instead of light, or actually um, inactivated matter. The formation of the light and the expanse on days one and two. And the, um, so that would be the position of the light and the, um, substance of the expanse not being light, but being earth and waters. The formation of the earth and plants on earth on day three, and the miracle related to the sun and moon on day four. That would be the placement of the um, lights in the expanse. So the first three were related to the Laplace Herschel nebular hypothesis and are solved by the modern protoplanetary disk model or circumsolar disk model. The plants have now been found in the Precambrian, and there is a, a model that's much better than just the lights appearing, the holist hypothesis where the axial tilt changed. So in a sense, Morton um, found the errors in Laplace Herschel and in paleontology with respect to plants and with the um, shift in the Earth's axial tilt. Didn't find that, but he found the problems with the um, day-age interpretation at that time. Okay, so now we move on to days five and six, where Guyot felt much more confident. As he said, the fifth and sixth days offer no difficulties for the unfold of the various tribes of animals, which people the water, the air, and the land in the, price, in the precise order indicated by geology. So he was a geologist and he knew that the invertebrates, um, first animals were invertebrates in the sea, then fishes followed, and the age of the first uh, land plants was in carboniferous rocks, which is true, but out of order. The age of reptiles in the Mesozoic rocks, the age of mammals in the tertiary, and humans at the end of the tertiary. So he could see the sequence was the same. And this is actually why they first thought that Moses' six days were aligned with paleontology. Uh, Morton had a few critiques. He said that birds did not exist in the Mesozoic. Well, he was wrong about that and that plants were out of order. And he was right about that, but now we found plants in the earlier period. Okay, let's move on to the sixth day. So Guyot thought that the sixth day represented the age of mammals, which we now know extended from 65 million years ago to the present. Uh, Guyot, Guyot knew where it was in geologic formations, but they didn't have radioisotope dating at the time. Uh, Guyot called it the tertiary period, but now it's called the Cenozoic. And um, one difference between Morton and Guyot was that Yo interpreted creeping things as just small mammals, but Morton correctly pointed out that creeping things include small reptiles. And so he said that Moses did not describe the age of mammals. But actually, um, it's a little more complicated than that. Mammal ancestry, as we now know from paleontology, uh, Morton and Guyot didn't know this. Uh, mammal ancestors evolved before the end of the Cretaceous extinction. Uh, which happened 65 million years ago. Here's the layer of high iridium uh, left over by the asteroid that caused the ex extinction. And so that wiped out the dinosaurs and enabled the evolution of modern mammals and small reptiles in the Cenozoic. 
So when it says God made the mammals, animals of the earth according to their kind, I think that means that God wiped out the dinosaurs with the end Cretaceous extinction. I mean, somebody could argue that, but it was a, a nice precise hit on an oil formation by an asteroid combined with a um, magma plume that was happening at the same time. And it did precisely wipe out the dinosaurs and um, allow a few mammals to live and fish and birds and crocodiles. Okay, well, let's move on to the last part of the six days, humans. And so Guillaume pointed out that humans came last in Moses' days of creation and in the fossil record. He had some interesting things to say about humans. He said, we often hear of paleontologists looking for the missing link between man and animal. The figure and structure of the ape is as near as need be to be called the link between man and animal. At that time, they didn't have the full or the fossil record that we have now of human evolution. And he said, the difference between the two beings is not in the shape of a thumb, et cetera, but in the moral nature, the invisible world of ideas, the religious element, the image of God. And there were no objections to this from Morton. Let's just summarize days five and six. Um, there was much more, or much closer agreement between Moses six days and natural history in this case. And there's not much change now. Um, I did summarize uh, a few of Morton's complaints or critiques, I should say. And if you wanna look at this more carefully, just please pause the video. I've also outlined the updates to the original day age interpretation, which is in black to the current model, which is in red which agrees well with Moses' six days and uh, current natural history. Again, you can stop the video if you'd like to look at this in more detail. And here's days four to six updates. Um, so there's the axial tilt in 580MA, which I believe happened. You can look in the text if you'd like to see more about that. Uh, chapter 7-3 describes the evidence. And for days five and six, there was minimal changes. Okay, so in summary, there were two main sequences that Guyot had correct. There was a dark cloud formation of light, expanse and formation of the planet were in line with Moses' days one through C's three sequence. And five animal categories were in order in days five and six. So there were nine common events in two sequences. And there were four discrepancies, if you want to look at it that way. The location of the sun was wrong. The materials in the disk and forming planet were wrong. The timing of the appearance of plants was wrong. And the appearance of the sun and moon was wrong, which Morton pointed out and which presaged modern uh, natural history. So in conclusion, there were discrepancies between Guyot's day age model based on 19th century natural history and Moses six days. Morton found the errors in the 19th century models of natural history by highlighting the areas, errors in Guyot's interpretation. Morton did not consider that the discrepancies were due to problems with natural history because he had already ruled out the possibility that God inspired Moses. And too bad that nobody took advantage of his insights. They might have become famous.